in terms of all of this morning with its beauty and its pageantry and the glory of what everyone works so hard to do, which is to create an atmosphere that really is filled with festival joy. When we come to the gospel reading, we actually have to step back a minute because they haven't gotten there yet. I mean, I almost had to put myself back into where I was Friday, Good Friday as it was called, as it is called. I was here for the noon service. And of course, there is this very long and dramatic reading of the story of the crucifixion of Jesus with the crowds, meaning all of us, shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And when you prepare to preach in a situation like that, it is inescapable that a part of what you do is actually spend time meditating and pondering on the physical death of Jesus. And it really is nothing less than what Jürgen Moltmann called a profane horror. The mutilated body of Jesus strung up on a cross, so disfigured by the lacerations and the wounds of the lashings and the beatings that it does, in fact, fulfill what is said in Isaiah when it says of that servant, he is one from whom we have hid our faces. So horrific was he, unless you were one of the hardened people who had seen plenty of crucifixions, you would turn away. And there were many who had. The iron rod of Roman authority never thought twice about executing the ultimate penalty for all kinds of infractions. Thinking about that, what Jesus endured in going home, empty house, I couldn't shake it. I kept thinking about it and what Jesus went through and knowing, of course, that it was for us that he did that. He didn't have to do it. It was his own choice. And that, in that moment is exactly where we pick up the story today. When they saw Jesus crucified, literally flailed, beaten, and finally dead, his followers left. They abandoned. What else was there to do? The grinding power of Rome's ultimate authority in essence, had won again. There was no hope at all. It was absolutely incontrovertible. They had seen it. Jesus had died. Into your hands I commend my spirit, and with that he breathed his last, as it says. So what, what were they to do now? especially those close to him who had spent the better part of three years of their lives with him. And so like what often happens when you're hit with that kind of horrific tragedy, you go numb. You don't know what else to do except just go home. But there was one who did not, and that's where the story picks up, is with Mary Magdalene, who alone is making her way to the tomb. It's a brave thing. In that country, in that countryside, under Roman authority, it was certainly not safe for her to travel by herself. She could be subject to any number of things. Muggings happened along the way, or worse, if she had actually encountered um, an unguarded group of garrison, or garrison of Roman soldiers. They would think nothing of taking her and using her. Rome operated with that kind of impunity. But she went. It was still dark. The first light array of the rays of the sun was just beginning to break over the horizon. I'm not sure she knew what she was going to do. I mean, if the stone was rolled in front of the grave, it's an extraordinarily heavy piece of granite. No one person can move it. And yet she went. But to her horror, she got there and she found that the stone was rolled away. 
she didn't have to think twice. Something has happened. They have taken the body. And she went running to Peter. Interesting, see, that she ran to Peter because this was the Peter who had denied Jesus three times, taken off like a shot in the dark. I never knew him, Peter said. And yet, it was still to him that she went. She also went to John, the beloved disciple, the one who was in, all through the gospel, is emotionally close to Jesus. She found both of them probably separately in each of their homes, and the two of them took off like a rocket, running to the two. John, probably because he's the younger, outran Peter, got to the tomb first, but then halted. You see, Jews don't go in graves. That's ritually unclean. He was not about to defile himself. So he stood there and just sort of peered in, not even sure at that point what he could actually see, how light was the, the dawn at that point. By contrast, no filters, Peter blew past him and ran right into the middle of the tomb itself. And then John got brave enough to stick his head in as well. And, and what did they find? Not, you see, in anything in terms of what they expected. You see, if it had been grave robbers, the whole interior place would have been in complete disarray. Trying to find out what they were looking for, were there any treasures of some sort actually hidden with the body? But what they found was actually a, the epitome of neatness. What? The, the shroud is laid out. And over here by itself is the piece of cloth that covers the head. Rolled up. What? They don't know what to make of it. All they know is Jesus is not there. And they have no idea in the world what would happen. And so what did they do? It says that the other disciple, meaning John, looked in. And when he saw, he believed. But it also goes on to say, but they did not yet understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. So it probably means he believed that, gosh, Mary told us the truth. And at that point, what were they to do? They, they went home. You see, they were living, as we've been talking about, in the terrifying unpredictability of enemy Roman occupation. Had a crime been committed there? What if the Roman soldiers who had been assigned to guard the tomb came back? Could they be arrested? Was this a crime scene? So they went home. What else were they to do? Whether they urged Mary Magdalene to go home as well, we don't know. The Scripture doesn't say. But the story is that she stayed, standing outside the tomb, weeping. Mary is the picture of despair, the complete loss of hope thoughts and emotions collapsing in on themselves. Have you ever been so deeply grieved, so wounded, that what's going on around you just fades into the distance, that all you know is the inner emptiness of loss? That's where Mary was. She had come as an act of genuine bravery to go, in essence, pay her last respect. And even that had been denied her. The man who had set her free, demons had been cast out of her. The most unlikely of disciples, at least if you wanted to count goodness, uprightness, I mean, it's, it's the mistake that churches often make. Oh, we really ought to get, go after her. She's got a great family. She's a big leader in her community. He's going to be elected to office. Wouldn't it be great if they came to our church? Jesus never did that. Never. In fact, he chose people that were extraordinary, unlikely, and that was actually the legacy of the church. Paul writes in Corinthians, he said, you know, not many of you were wise or of noble birth. The things that we often prize, you see. All she knew was that he was gone. She could not do what she hoped to do and was literally in that grief, completely blind to what was going on around her. 
So she bends over to look into the tomb, the Scripture says, but she can't actually really see what's there, because what's there? She sees two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet, almost like the two cherubim at the Ark of the Covenant. What? If a normal human being at that point had seen angels, they would have been on their face in terror. Angels could be messengers of anything. And if God showed up, what would happen then? But she's lost to all of that. And they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she answers as if it was the friend next door. They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. The angels don't answer. One commentator, I love this, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But one commentator said that the reason they didn't answer, because they can see behind Mary and Jesus appears, and that strikes them as mute. But somehow they knew, and Mary knew, and she's intuitively sensed enough to sort of turn around. Have you ever had that feeling when somebody's staring at you from behind? Who's looking at me? And so she turns around. But she doesn't know that it's Jesus. And Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Notice the tenderness, the gentleness of the question. He could have just as easily have said, like one of the angels says in one of the other accounts, why seek the living from the dead? But he doesn't. It's very, very kind. Woman, why are you weeping? There's a match. When you're talking to someone in great difficulty, one of the things that should happen is, is that when you raise a question with someone in that kind of grief, there should be a tone in your voice that it allows the question to come in to that place of grief. And that's exactly what Jesus does. She still doesn't know who it is, but she's not offended by the question. Supposing him to be the gardener, she says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Well, she actually couldn't have done that. We're talking about the dead weight of a very heavy body. And if Jesus had been prepared according to the rites of what happens when a Jew would be buried, he would have been packed in over 75 pounds of aromatic spices. It's a lot of weight. But that's what you do, don't you? When you're in that place of grief and sadness, you express an aspiration, even if you can't actually do what you said you would. So what does Jesus do? Again, he doesn't go, oh, don't be silly. He says her name. And if you've ever been in love, or if you ever had a very good friend, when you hear their voice, even if it's coming from another room, something picks up inside of you. Anticipation happens. You're looking forward to seeing them coming around the corner, even as you hear their voice. And he says, Mary. And again, it goes right into the heart of her grief, and there's a point of recognition, and she recognizes, even though she cannot fully see who he is through her tears, Rabboni, it's you. And what does she do? Of course, what any of us would, would do. She literally runs to him and wants to throw her arms around him, so much so that Jesus has to say, no, 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 not yet. I'm ascending to my Father. And besides, you have work to do. Go and tell the disciples. And what does he say? I love this. He said, go and tell the disciples, and he calls them my brothers. Now look at these people. Every single one of them had forsaken him. Many of them at that point, I'm sure, were asking, did we get it wrong? Is he really not who he said he was? Is he just some delusional prophet? Yeah, he did miracles, but the Messiah? And yet he still calls them my brothers. It's a point for us. I, I want you to know, no matter where you are in terms of your faith, what you believe, what you don't believe, what 
questions you have in your mind, what makes intellectual nonsense to you, what the hungers of your heart are. The story is, is that Jesus is more than willing to, to receive you, to hear your questions, to listen to what's going on in your heart, even the things perhaps that you don't want to admit to anyone. He wants to hear those things from you. Why? Because he wants also to call you his brother, his sister, a member of his family. Don't think that somehow to be able to, in essence, qualify, I have to be a certain kind of person to get in. Remember, the good ones didn't make the disciple list in the Bible. No, 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 the invitation is much wider, much deeper, much more encompassing than that. Believe me, if Jesus can call these disciples who did not stand up for him, who in fact in Peter's case actually lied that he'd ever knew him, that, mean, that means there's room for you and me. Because isn't it true? Let's get real a minute. When it comes to our reputation or being honest, many of us will lie. Yeah, nod your head. Hello, we're in this together. That when it comes to putting yourself in a place of personal embarrassment, much less danger as it relates to your Christian faith, more than one of us, I am sure, has just at that point chosen to fade into the background rather than step out and say something. I was struck this week. There was a, a piece on the news it actually went viral, it was on the net, about a woman who came through a drive through to pick up some coffee. And um, when she, her husband had just died, like 24 hours earlier. So she got up to the drive through window to pay, and she, like grief does, it just overtook her right there. She couldn't speak. And finally she got up, my husband died yesterday. And what did the barista do? God bless him. He literally reached through the window and said, may I pray for you? And he put his hand through the window on her shoulder and prayed for her right there in the drive through That is the witness of resurrection power, when you are not afraid, or when you're afraid but you do the right thing anyway. Go and tell my brothers, Jesus says, what? That I am ascending to my Father and your Father. See, we're in this one together. That's what Jesus is saying. To my God and your God. There is no rejection. There is no condemnation. There's no place for shame. Shame is one of the works of the devil that continues to keep you at arm's length from God because you think if I get too close, the shame place will be exposed, and then I'm just done for. Jesus never does that. Ever. It's not that he doesn't know. He knows it all. And he wants you to share with him your secrets. But they're safe with him. With him there's mercy. With him there's redemption. With him there's a way to make even the worst things right. And so Mary takes off like a shot. An apostle to the apostles, as she was called going to share the good news to the men who were still afraid and hiding out in their homes. What does this have to say? Briefly, first of all, for the writer of the Gospel of John, Easter really happened. This is not, as N.T. Wright says, this, the clever point of fiction. The writer is attempting to present a coherent, incredible portrait. There are, they are anything but cardboard cutouts, producing stock responses and questions. William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury a hundred years ago or so, even goes so far as to say the details, the John outrunning Peter, the place of the grave clothes, all of this are the kind of descriptions that can only come from an eyewitness account. This happened in history, and a part of what we have to deal with is the fact that a man was raised from the dead. And in fact, that's really the second thing. A body was raised from the dead by God. If it was resuscitation, as if somehow Jesus had been drugged on the cross and the rest of it was just made up, it, it wouldn't look like this. Can you imagine if he was in fact drugged and came up? He's like this. He's wrapped in a shroud. 
the thing would have been torn to shreds in him trying to get out. The cloth torn off his face, getting out of there. But notice, remember, the shroud is all laid out. The headpiece is all rolled up. There's a wonderful sense of authority and pace. God is at work, and He's not rushing it for anyone. This was orchestrated, you see. This is something much more than a man coming back to life. God has acted with authority to do something decisive and new. And the point of this is to see Jesus for who He is, not who it is that we might imagine Him to be. If you think Jesus will keep you at arm's length because of what you have done, that's not the Jesus of the Gospels. If you think the Jesus, the Jesus that you know will kind of let you get away with anything and know that it's okay because you'll be forgiven, that's not the Jesus that we know. The Jesus that we know is a complete realist when it comes to the human condition. He is willing to forgive anything, anything. But it, we, it means we must come to Him and say yes to the tenderness and the kindness of His invitation, breaking through the places of our own shame and grief, open our hearts to that which we could never create for ourselves, and that is the resurrection power of God breaking into our lives and doing something new, something that we could never imagine, something we could never create for ourselves. I, I would urge you this morning, particularly if you're regular, there is such a thing as the monotony of church. Nod your head. It's okay to acknowledge that. Where you go through the same thing Sunday after Sunday, and it just, it just, it's road. It just literally comes off the top of your head without actually penetrating your heart. Don't let that happen. Listen to this story afresh. Hear the appeal of the Savior. John says at the end of his gospel, there are many things that could be written about Jesus. In fact, they could fill the world with volumes. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, and in believing have life on his name. That's what this is about. It's about a challenge and an invitation. A challenge to say, how are you living do you live as if God raised Jesus from the dead? And if not, why not? Do you think it doesn't matter? And an invitation, an invitation to the one who loves you like no one else, who will heal and restore and forgive and set your heart on fire with his love. That's this Jesus. God raised him from the dead. Will you say yes and mean it? Amen.